Hey guys, welcome to Rock Talks. Today we are talking to Jeremy Creamer, bass player of Duff and former Chimera. We discuss the whole Crown of Phantoms era, you know the very last Chimera studio album, the possibility of a Duff reunion for next year, some crazy stories from Ozfest 2007, and more. If you like this interview, please give me a thumbs up, leave a comment, and share the video with all your friends. Also, very important, please don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell. By the way, if you see a little ad advertisement at the beginning, in the middle, or at the end of the video, please do not skip it. By doing that, you're helping me a lot. Come on, guys, it's just a few seconds of your life, and it will really make a difference for me. I'm counting on all of you. Enjoy the interview. All right. So how did you get the Chimera gig back in 2012, right? Um, I got a phone call from Emil Wersler and uh, and I just moved to Pittsburgh here at the time and was kind of just settling down my roots and meeting people and doing some local work. And Emil called and was like, Mark Hunter wants to keep Chimera going. It'll be, you know, Doth plus Austin and and this guy Matt Schlacka and and really, you know that I was just like sign me up just to play more time with that band, especially, um, Emil and Sean Z. You know, it's like once you go down such a path, we've kind of formed this tight bond and and we know how each other travels, we know each other how each other works, and we know that each other will like push us to a new level. So I just got the call and was like, I'll see you in Cleveland. And it's just only a couple hours north of here. So um, I went up there and we started writing Crown of Phantoms. Uh, but you did the, the Crown of Phantoms, no, the, the Age of Hell tour first, right? I did not. What ended up happening is um, we sure. were touring. No, uh, that actually ended up being Amol. Um, yeah, yeah for when Jim had left, uh, Emil ended up helping them by playing bass on a tour we were on. Um, as Duff. As Duff. Yeah, so he played bass with them. Then as that progressed and they were going to get into doing another record. There was no more touring left when I got inserted into the band for Age of Hell. Um, and I actually, the first thing I did with them was as a linolide made remixes from Age of Hell that you can find somewhere oh, yeah. on the internet. Um, oh, you, you did that, right. Yeah, yeah. So I did that before I played with them and then They, there were offers to do a little bit of touring, especially Soundwave Festival in Australia. Um, and that's kind of why the band in its final form got together was to tour a bit with that and a couple other tours that they had opportunities to do, which then led to making Crown of Phantoms. So that tour in Australia was before the making of Crown of Phantoms? Yes, that was all a entirely old school Camara set with no new material on it. We just kind of did the, the greatest hits and we did the Soundwave tour and then the off dates with Machine Head. And that, that was an amazing tour because uh, we showed up and everyone kind of had a preconceived notion of what Camara was. Uh, and we just came out there like fucking lightning, man. Like <laughs> we went to those stages and we're playing those old songs and just the technicality that we were playing them with and the, the tightness because most of us had been in some form of band or on tour together before. Um, everyone was really psyched at that point. Like, I remember like we'd be there and the Machine Head crew were just like, oh my, you know, my Billy and them were freaking the fuck out as we were killing those songs. So it was a very exciting time. It was really cool. And then that kind of led to off those tour opportunities, writing material and then kind of doing the new new look, Doth Mera. Mm -hmm. How difficult was to, to fill the shoes for 
Jim Lamarca, not technically, because I can tell that you are better musician than Jim. I'm not trashing yeah. Jim, just the truth. But well, I mean, let's let's talk about rock and roll. So when let you me finish get... my question, please. Oh no, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. My question was in the sense that Jim Lamarca was very very famous for being the like the like the, the light of the party. He's yes, like very, very much so. He's really very much so. he's like really out there for the whole and, Emira history. And on all of the sudden he's not there. Of course, a Amol uh, replaced him first, but then you come up as a permanent bass player for Chimera. Yeah. So in that sense, how difficult it was to to shoes uh, to to fill uh, Jim's shoes? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I was going to kind of answer your question with your your question. Uh, <laughs> the uh, you know, it's like rock and roll is so much bigger than how well you play an instrument and he literally was you know and if you look at the old look camara um he was one of the you have to kind of have everything as a rock band to succeed you have to have a strong show you have to have a strong presence with your audience you have to have a savvy business guy you have to you know you have to have all of these weapons to to really succeed, honestly. And he was integral in the old Camara because you had, you know, Mark was a great front man. You had Rob, who is one of the sickest classic metal riffsters. You know, like yeah. if you if you want to get to know Rob Arnold, you go stand next to a fire and have like an hour long conversation with that dude about Metallica. Yeah, yeah. And, he's a huge and, and, and and you will understand that dude's fired. And really, he was the tone of the band. You know what I mean? Uh, and and Spacuza was the look of the band, but <laughs> but Lamarca was the rock and roll. You know, it's like if all those guys nerded out or went back to the bus or were very low key, that doesn't give you that that rock and roll presence that I talk about, like with my new band where where the show gets bigger or, you know, that guy provided so many times when maybe Mark was off on the bus, you know, after a show that dude went and had connections with so many fans uh, and really was a friend to people around the world. And all of those things are so important. So, so I never really filled those shoes as well as he could but i feel like sean z kind of took you know him and mark kind of took because mark was a lot more social with sean z because they were such great friends that i really kind of think that they took up that you know i took up more of the art side and you know there were cool things we all kind of had new secret weapons you know yeah. um you know i was lucky that when we would do recording sessions, you know, I could sit in there and give my opinion and people would listen about just overall general aesthetic style, how to do phrasing, stuff like that. Um, and just kind of let, let that deeper musical knowledge and stuff, you know, add a new thing there while the social presence was somewhere else. And, you know, me and Emil at that point, you know, kind of were like peanut butter and jelly. Like if he played something, I knew what I was going to play. So um, we were just having that musical conversation. So what I added was, you know, more noty. And what he added was uh, more personality. But they're, they're both, definitely both strong things, but they're just not the same, you know? Yeah, yeah. And... How was the vibe uh, while recording Crown of Phantoms? Did everybody contribute to it? Yeah, I mean, at that point, um, like I had said, you know, half of us had been in bands for a long time. Other, others of us had toured. You know, we'd already kind of known Mark on a level. And, or like, you know, Emil had already toured with Austin because of the Age of Hell. You know, there were so many layers of connectivity. Um, that were there that kind of ran really deep. And 
we all really kind of respected and loved each other. So we would all kind of get together and a couple guys, you know, Emil and Mark would put the song down the path and then we would all kind of craft it into what it made it into. And, uh, and I mean, that is an all-star line in, a, in itself, you know? So yeah. I think, you know, maybe our, I think maybe if we had called it something else and moved on, uh, you know, you'd never know what would happen, but I, I would certainly think it would have gotten more exposure than maybe it did uh, because everybody had something so significant to add to that project from Austin to Matt to, you know, Emil to me to Sean Z, Mark Hunter, you know, if we had called it, you know, Dragon Piss, like we probably would have charted. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I remember I, back back then. I, I remember back then in 2012, 2013. Yeah, right. Yeah. And some fans, or maybe like 50% of the fans, I'm I'm not sure, but there was a group of fans that didn't accept this new lineup. They were yeah. they were missing so much. You know, Rob and Matt and you know Jim and the the classic Chimera lineup. Yeah, for sure. Back then, I was like, shut up, man. Listen to the new album, and then you can judge. Yeah. And, and yeah. especially go to see live that lineup. You live in America. You got the chance. I live in fucking Peru. I will never have the chance. So before you make a judgment, watch the band live and listen to the record. And in my opinion, yeah. I'm not... It was but I can tell that the, the Crown of Phantoms lineup know everybody was better musicians than the classic chimera lineup even for robert yeah. different we'll, we'll call it different okay all right <laughs> there is no better you know art is subjective uh you know i would say it's it, you know how people absorb and interact with music uh has to do with so much further than the notes you know and for somebody that maybe saw the original Camara lineup on Farm Club and, yeah. you know, that sparked a moment in their lives, you know, we're not going to bring back that memory, you know. Um, for somebody that really appreciates the very, you know, old school, major minor, Metallica based thrash and metal that Rob appreciated in the same way that gave all of those amazing riffs up to age of hell, uh, their, their weight and, 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 you know, like they could open for Slayer and the Slayer audience would understand the tonality of Chimera naturally better than they would yeah. all of us kind of doth gypsy jazz classical music guys that that you know don't necessarily put it in the blues box so much you know um you know they're not going to get that same appreciation uh when we kind of veer off and and do different things or like kind of veer into hardcore kind of put a rap beat under it you know um those those aren't the moments that made early Camara special for those fans and but that's music in general you know that i i find now that i'm older you know you end up liking an era of a band you very rarely other than maybe one or two things love a band's whole catalog and but i think that's a mistake that's like being close-minded because it's at the end of the day it's about music not faces no? yeah for sure for sure but also you know like like we've been discussing a little that that conversation has to be there with uh you know everyone thinks that an audience member is just there to listen but they are participating in the conversation if they're a good audience member because they're relating to the content that's being presented in front of them yeah. um and you know that can't happen all the time with all things you know if 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 the audience member changes, maybe they've grown up. You know, if you look at the lyrical content that Mark Hunter was throwing at the beginning versus the end of his career, you know, those are two different stories for two different age groups of people for two different uh, times, you know? And 
So I do agree with you that if you put in the effort to grow with a band and relate it to the growing of yourself, and those are on similar trajectories, it can be a very beautiful thing, you know? Uh, but, you know, few people I know that listen to, you know, uh, have you seen this uh, Pat Finnerty show on YouTube? Uh, no, not really. Uh, he's this great guy and he does these kind of like musical conversations like this. He's some guy from Philly with the YouTube channel, check him out. And uh, he did this episode on Weezer, okay? And it was why Beverly Hills sucked. It wasn't the sweater song. It wasn't early Weezer. You know, it's just this commercial piece of trash uh, that happened later in their career. And he's like, why don't I love Weezer? And he literally gets into this psychological battle of like, well, what got me into Weezer? It was that time of my life when I had my friends and we were in the garage. And, you know, when you can be with a band and, and stay with their trajectory and grow up with them, that's a beautiful thing. But just like in all of our relationships everywhere, that doesn't always work out. So you should never be upset for not liking a band's new material. You've just grown another way, like you would in a relationship or with some car you drive or something. But, uh, but I do agree, it can be very special to grow with that, but it doesn't have to be, you know, those, those fans don't have to get the same thing and new people can get new stuff, you know, Perspective change is a beautiful thing and it happens daily. So you can't fault anybody for saying, I don't like this or I do like this. You can only connect or not connect, really. Yeah, so, you know, most people like the records they, they listened to when they were teenagers, right? When they were in high school. You know, some people are, were like, oh yeah, yeah. I, liked, I love the impossibility of reason. I love the, self, the self-titled era. Because I was I was like 15, 16, 17, I was in high school. And I was like, what about the age of hell? I, I didn't even listen to the record. Why? I don't know, man. I, I started to listen to something else and blah blah blah. And... But then the death core then or whatever. Yeah. Right? It, you know, or or maybe they got into 70s classic rock, you know, who knows? You know, it's like um just the way. I will say this about the Chimera, anybody that was a musician, anybody who was in a band that was around Chimera previously, anybody that was interested in it technically loved us and, you know, and really appreciated us and were happy we were there, but that's not- You mean the Crown of Phantoms lineup, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, You know, but that, those people don't relate to Camara the same way that maybe some kid who heard I hate everyone <laughs> yeah. in the Midwest, you know what I mean? And that's, uh, totally. Totally. well, it's not, you know, it's just how people relate to music. And, you know, we played that song. We played it really well. You could come see it, you know, but maybe we didn't bring back the same nostalgia for those things, you know? I, I still feel in the end, if we had some, even if we called it, you know, bottle of water and like said X Camara, X Dop, you know, uh, I think all of those people then wouldn't even have had a stake in any conversation because it wasn't Camara, you know, and I think it would have been absolutely fine, but it is what it is. And it's a great thing to be attached to a legacy on, even if it's not their biggest thing, it's part of the, the whole thing and I think it's a special part of it where there's less limitations and if you listen to Mark Hunter's vocals on that and you're a fan of his you can see the personal growth you can see comments about his time in the industry you can see comments he about really mad during recording that album. he sounds yeah <laughs> well I mean he was mad at the first thing I mean he started with I hate everyone so where do you like <laughs> Where do you go from there? If you hate everyone already, like how do you get better yeah. than that? <laughs> but yeah, I remember that. Some fans were saying they should change the name. You know, if they were uh, with another name, maybe I would like this more. But that's bullshit, man. They they said the same thing about Sepultura, you know, back in the late 90s. Oh, of course, of yeah. course. And they, they're still amazing lineup and players. And of course. Who, who fucking doesn't want to go see a rise? Of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, like I said, it's 
at the end of the day, it's all about the music, not the faces, the band. Yeah. Please, please. Well, and that's a big common thing, you know, I mean, just how we've talked about the story of how I met a group of people in music that connected and started doing more music together. And that led us to through two bands and heavy metal, you know, I bet if you talk to John Five, he'd say a very similar thing about the group of musicians he's worked with, you know, that have played for Marilyn and then for Rob Zombie, you know, when you look at you know, early in with Doth, we first did a tour and we had Jim Malone from Arsis playing with us as another guitar player, you know? I mean, it's like these, these communities are, even though they're loved around the world, they're very small, tight-knit groups of friends, you know? When you look at the, the community around, you know, Static X and, you know, Tony Campos and that crew, that's a band that, that goes and fills a few bands roles you know and even the old hair metal dudes you know it's like i think the dude from Dokken has played on every freaking record that you didn't know he played on uh <laughs> as a studio drummer it's it's a small group of things uh so all these other things like titles and and names and all you know those are all integers and it's really about the conversation that all of these musicians are having with each other over time right so to everybody who's watching this go listen to crown of phantoms right away. yes please I please fight for that album every time <laughs> i love that record if you get into that record and let it absorb you and play it front to back there's there's a there's a nice story there and it's deeper than you think and there's so many layers and just so much good music. My favorite thing was actually watching Rob Arnold recently yeah. <laughs> listen to it. For the first time, right? I got a giggle, right? Yeah, who knows, you know, like YouTube videos. But uh, but yeah, I mean, that 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 made me happy. I was like, well, cool. You know, I mean, because I love Rob, you know, we're all friends. It's not like, He's amazing. you know. It would be way probably cooler if it was evil and underhanded, you know, <laughs> if there was like a bunch of spit on the wall. But everybody's generally friends and it toured with each other. So they were all kind of like good luck, you know. Yeah, yeah. And why did the band come to an end? Because I remember pretty much everybody left at the same time, right? First yeah. And then all of the guys. Except I mean, I would say that some of what we've been talking about played uh, into a pivotal thing. You know, you have extensively, you have two kinds of, you know, Mark and Camaro, when they originally got signed for Roadrunner, uh, you know, that, that was like the end of the old music business. Yeah. And, you know, they started on television, they started with a bus, they had label support in ways that modern bands didn't, you know, they got to play with Slipknot and Slayer and this festival, that festival, huge, you know, things. Uh, it was the end of music videos, you know, where they had popular music videos. And the end so, of <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Uh, and then, you know, Amo, me, Sean, Mashlaka, Austin, you know, we all were from a very different school of doing music where we all got in very shitty vans, drove 12 hours, broke down twice on the way, you know, and this happens on tour buses and everything, but our perspective was much more, you know, get Kevin Talley and just fucking make it as that dude like sells $5 DVDs out of his backpack. <laughs> I mean, like very hustle oriented. And, you know, and part of how we were saying was since it was Camara and naturally we just ended up, even though we had rights to the new material, basically like, you know, we were the hired guns of, you know, playing these tunes that, and this business, you know, it, extensively when you look at a band, 
there's a business behind all of this music happening and a lot of that is around merch and all of these huge things that make money for people and that's why bands get opportunities because people think they can make money um so you know you had people who were trying to kind of like make this chimera resurgence happen and then you just had a bunch of like you know clawing motherfuckers just wanting to be the best at music and everything else and when when kind of that duality of like well this can be you know it was almost bigger than chimera because chimera the brand itself kind of had been going down for a while and was playing smaller clubs and didn't have as many opportunities and you know i would say you know, being on a label like E1 or something, you know, they're not like guiding you, helping you like a road runner. They're just putting you on your own path. And I think that when you have different visions of what something can be inherently, then things just fall apart, you know? Like we, all of us love going and playing, but we weren't gonna, if we didn't have full stake in something, you know, we're not just gonna sit there and like, place so that t-shirts can be made for other people you know in the end you know it's like those business things versus the music things like i said if it had been a entirely different new band and it was like six dudes who all have a stake in it you know i think it would have been a different story you know but like trying to like rebrand you know trying to like resurrect chimera and then you know as far as the business side, it really only being like Mark and the t-shirt manufacturer and the person at the label as far as like who had the Camara steak, yet everyone else is like hustling and tumbling, you know, that 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 gets messy like a family, you know. So basically it, it didn't match your expectations. Um financial I mean at least. Well, you know, if you I'll say this, if you go into doing art, music, anything creative that isn't on the technical side and your motivation is money, then you're, you lost yesterday. You know, I mean, um, you know, with these kind of things, you could never recoup the money and time and effort and love. And, you know, that's just, that's never can be your number one thing. And I think, you know, although that plays a factor in it, it's just like, it's more about the experience and the outlets and, you know, them trying to make Camara happen is a different thing than this exciting new band that is your, your favorite band's favorite band, like I was saying, you know? Um, and for that to just be all over a name and then just ever working so hard for that to be a, a defeating cycle of like, oh, you can't live up to this thing versus like, well, technically it's more better, you know, that just like opens up a weird conversation where you're not just even a band anymore. Uh, so, you know, maybe the universe just split it up because of its contradictory paradox, you know, who knows, but uh, it's just, you know, once you get down and dirty, if you're going to like, then at that point, spend years of your life doing that, and it's going to be like, spark semi-interest, you're just not going to like, delve deeper. All of us, you know, work with so many people that, you know, it's just like, we all have other stuff to do. So whatever we're doing has to be at a level of the highest. And if it's not going to be uh, and we're not being fulfilled, then a lot of us won't do it, you know. <laughs> so yeah. it comes down to, you know, if you got a guy like Amo that's selling guitars and amps for Paul Reed Smith and playing with Tony McAlpine, you know, I mean, he's not going to sit around to play a dive bar in Dallas unless it means a lot to him. You know what I'm saying? I know. And, uh, and we all are like that. Like I said, we came in, it's an all-star, you know, look at Austin's playing with Dez and, you know, 
Matt Schlacka is off with Broken Hope. You know, it's like everyone's doing so many things. So for any project to, to really captivate series artist time, it has to hold weight. And, you know, that just started losing weight for a lot of people real quick, you know. Your days with Duff. So my yeah. first question is, any chance for a Duff reunion tour or a one-off gig maybe next year? <laughs> In the next year, I will give you this. Uh, I have been remixing Sean Z's project, Velocitor. Um, nice. And so I've been screwing up his vocals in my computer and there's, there's gonna be something real heavy, like five songs coming out. We don't have a release date yet for it because we're kind of deciding how we would roll it out. Um, but I have finished mixes up here on my computer and I won't spoil it for you now, but uh, they're, they're sounding heavy. So at least the Sean Z, Jeremy C collaboration will come out this year. And, uh, and I even think he mentioned on your show as well uh, that we've, we've been having discussions. We just kind of have to find the right way and timing that it works out for everybody. Yeah. Uh, because a lot of that magic of that band was that everybody was so talented. You know, when we left Atlanta, we felt like we were an all-star band that nobody knew. You know, we had Amal, we had Sean Z, who's by far one of the most talented, like vocalists and yes. front presences ever. You know, it's I like agree. the death. I've seen that dude do shit. I saw him lay the floor when we were opening for Anthrax in Wales. Uh, at Hammerfest, which was hilarious. Uh, we opened for Anthrax and he came out and did a song with Mark Hunter and the place just laid down. Like, like the show was over. He just destroyed the place and just everyone let, nobody even cared about Anthrax. And that, really? was, that was all kind of like Mark Hunter putting it, teeing it up and Sean Z just had his vocal thing and just, destroyed it it was like one of those moments uh when a singer just ends a venue in a way you know so mm -hmm. you know and al is you know i used to call him like the black metal santana you know he really gave all those <laughs> lyrical melodic elements to doth and that was like just as important as uh amel shredding and you know kevin talley what do i gotta say about that you know I mean, like, <laughs> Like just getting to be in a van in like West Texas with that dude reading a map before we all had Google <laughs> Maps and, and being like, we'll make it on gas, you know, and waking up <laughs> at eight in the morning to have a egg McMuffin at McDonald's. He's like, it's my turn to drive, you know. I mean, geez. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah, the amount of stories with that guy. Uh, but we really, especially you know, being like the last kind of van roadrunner death metal band. Yeah. Um, we just had such a unique experience. And, you know, we had like Monty Connor, this guy that was trading death metal tapes and, and thrash tapes in the 80s, like really like, you know, kind of the one of the first megaphones of the scene kind of leading us with roadrunner. And we, you know, we had a kind of a great time being such a, a potent band just going off and touring with bands like Goat Whore and just real special people and kind of like digging deep into the clubs of America, you know? So next year we can hope for a Duff geek, maybe. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll give you the exclusive on if there's going to be something that happens. Uh, the most likely path right now is that we'll probably try to like put together a single or an EP or something small that we can kind of give because we all love each other and we all love playing music with each other and we love the kind of community we feel special because a lot of times for us we were kind of your favorite band's favorite band in a way uh you know and we had so much support from musicians we wouldn't even think of we'd show up and they'd be like we love you guys and we're like we'll take us on tour <laughs> you know but uh <laughs> yeah. you know and especially with like players, that was kind of that first era of, you know, the access to guitar where like everyone played guitar and we would show up and there would just be these players that would just come and uh, adore us in really nice ways. And it, it, it was a, a cool 
place to be where people appreciated our our skill and talent and stuff like that and, and we got to have deeper conversations about art and music with people through it and that that's more than just kind of you know drinking the jaeger and doing meet and greets and being dumb we got to kind of delve deeper into it a lot with within our own artist community and with the fan community and that that made it special and we just want to make sure that if we do something moving forward that it's a nice tribute to all of that and it's not just oh here's a single that you know because we could all right can't wait <laughs> yeah me really either I, forward I can't wait either i'm submitting demos you know i mean i think if that's at this point is somebody's gonna have to do like 20 percent of the work and be like here's the song and you know the new world means we can work on it in five different cities so even if that ends up happening you know i think it's just a matter of time and and letting the space let us all kind of get hungry enough to to put a new statement in it not just kind of rehash the past awesome yeah the past is great but we sh we always should be looking forward to it you know it, yeah for sure it's you know, it's kind of, it shows you how you've gotten to where you're at. And now you always kind of have to see what's next. I mean, that's kind of why I hop around in so many art mediums and all of that anyways, because I'm always looking to, you know, make the conversation deeper. And to do that, you got to find perspective, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, one of the best things ever about my heavy metal era was it was the first era I got to travel the world and, and and that really changes you. Once you meet so many people everywhere and you realize that we're all people, you know, it really changes the way you look at the world. And, and I just, I think it would be, you know, now I just want to open that conversation everywhere, you know? Yeah, for the record, I love Velocitor. Really, really good band with Sean C. On yeah, yeah, they're really cool. Uh, it's been cool, you know, when you get to do stuff like I do, you get to, Get the recording and i actually get to get play with all the tracks and see how they recorded it and stuff and too and uh that's a really cool record and i'm doing something that is complete 180 to it so it'll be like a whole nother layer in the the meal you know Interesting. It, yeah it's really cool and his vocals are so strong on that record it's just like uh especially when you have him soloed up and it's just sean z there and he's got like You know, he's doing four voices and it's like harmony, but in a heavy way, you know, and it's yeah, not yeah. trying He's sitting there doing whispers, shouts, screams, guttural stuff, actual tonal singing. And he's doing it in like five layers all on top of each other. It's really great stuff. Awesome. So you got the chance to play Ausfest in 07, right? With Dot. Uh, yeah, for sure. What's, what's yeah. your, your craziest memory about being in that uh, legendary tour? <laughs> um, there's so many. Um, it's just the weird moments, you know, that was the, uh, the first free Ozfest or where they like didn't charge for tickets. It was the last like traveling one. Um, so there were a lot of dynamics with it that, that, that were very unique to just that Ozfest and it was amazing. Um, I will say like a good, great Kevin Talley story. We, <laughs> we, you know, it's like when you go on Ozfest, it's like every other day and you play like a side show, you know, on the other day. So sometimes you have days off. We ended up in Dallas early and we're staying there late. And we were in an, like an airport shuttle uh, <laughs> kind of thing not on a, one of these buses and somehow that year only they let you just kind of show up in your van if you wanted to. Um, so we were hanging out a lot with like the sideshow circus and um, we ended up just like partying after the Dallas show. That party kind of moved to where everyone had left the amphitheater and me and Kevin Talley kind of had realized uh, that the lock key for a trailer worked in the golf carts, you know, at the <laughs> venue. So we just took our trailer key over, grabbed the cart, grabbed, you know, like <laughs> Jackie the Human Tripod and Madam Flyerfly and a couple of the carnies. We loaded up a cart, drove it up onto the main stage, did some like figure eights, <laughs> like drove it up the hill of the grass arena in Dallas. And then like 
went down the back and if you've ever been there it's like super steep it's like a water slide and uh and and all i you know i'm looking here and i look left and kevin tally's got you know madam firefly who's like three feet tall you know she's like 40 years old or whatever but she's like uh just this amazing thing and he's like holding her and the sword sweller is next to him and i'm there and like we're all like just like jackass style going down the back of the amphitheater coming out uh you know the party lasted all night burning fires in the empty parking lots and just kind of being freaks and then uh, the next show we showed up to there was a letter from Sharon Osborne there for us that was just like don't fuck up again um <laughs> You know, but you you know everyone has their little fun, and as long as you don't uh, screw up anything too bad, and uh, then you know it's that's a little rock and roll, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> I've we have so many freaking stories from that tour; it's unbelievable. I mean, that's kind of like uh, rock and roll summer camp, right? You yeah, yeah it, is. it is. And the friends you meet there, if you look at that, we toured with uh, you know, like in this moment and Ankla. Ankla were, were like our homies, you know, it was like us, Ankla and the, mainly the band from In This Moment, we were like the wake up, have breakfast kind of crew and like just sit there and smoke weed out of like an apple from catering and uh, <laughs> everyone would break up guitars and we just all kind of have jam sessions in the back. Uh, and then, you know, we'd all be in this nerdy guitar jam session. You got like Hatebreed and Behemoth and all these bands like lifting weights like it's a gym, you know, <laughs> just like 30 feet away from you. Just great stuff, you know. Do you, want, do you want one more story? Yeah, sure. All right. So we're in Connecticut and it's after the night and that's kind of it was hitting towards the end of the tour. And uh, so we started having barbecues. Uh, and so Lamb of God decided to come down to the second stage and have like the biggest ass barbecue once there, once the second stage had closed. And uh, so everybody had showed up, you know, tons of people from even like the audience, like were there, just a huge surrounded circle of people around basically Randy Blake cooking wings uh, and chicken and just grilling stuff on this little barbecue grill. Everybody's drinking, you know, it's like a sponsored event. So it's like, there's Jaeger and beer and just shit everywhere. We're all just partying. Like if you could imagine like 20 tour buses and just being aisles of just this huge party, just all centered by Randy grilling. Uh, <laughs> so we partied, for, you know, for hours. And then all of a sudden it was like time for bus call. Everyone's got to leave. And Instantly, Randy Blythe picks up this grill, you know, over his head and just slams it on the ground. And actually, I believe in one of their documentaries, you can see actually like a two second unlabeled snippet of this insane party. But as soon as he does this, like everyone took whatever they were holding and just threw it somewhere. Like, like buses and trailers and shit are getting decked and smacked by all these bottles. It was amazing. And then 30 fucking seconds later, the entire cleaning crew from the amphitheater started like sweeping through all of us as, as like, like as soon as there was just a fucking mess everywhere. And instantly, you know, there's a line of people just like cleaned up the entire parking lot. Everyone left and it was over in like, you know, 20 minutes from the time of that being thrown to completely cleared out. It was like oh. the weirdest fucking thing ever. <laughs> and uh, remember Kevin Talley cut open his foot because he was wearing flip-flops at that party and he had to duct tape <laughs> his foot for three days on tour until he could keep it closed. <laughs> Play, playing the doubles like hey. you know, <laughs> Jesus. All right, enough of that. But uh, those are some Ozfest stories. You know, it's like, if you're one of the lucky people that gets to do something like that, um, even once, like somebody like me, uh, you're blessed, right? If you like this interview, please give me a thumbs up, leave a comment, and share the video with all your friends. Also, very important, please don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell.